This is the Puck Junk Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Puck Junk Hockey Podcast. I'm Sal Barry and with me is Tim Parrish and Clemente Lisi. And today we are going to talk about the 1993-94 Leaf Hockey Set. We are going to do a set retrospective, a setrospective, if you will, looking back 30 years at the very first ever Leaf Hockey Card Set. Clemente and I are also going to talk about a couple of shows that we went to over the past weekend and we'll probably talk about a few other odds and ends to round out the podcast. So, gentlemen, how are you doing today? Tired. Anyone? Tired? <laughs> That's it? Just tired? That's all you have? That's it. It's the holidays and a lot going on. Yeah, it's true. Oh, by the way, I just want to tell everybody, if you've listened to the last two episodes, you probably noticed we had a little bit of an echo, echo, echo problem, like towards the latter half of the podcast. No idea what that's happening. We're trying out a new way of doing things. Hopefully this solves the problem because, you know, as always, we want to deliver a great product. I mean, even though it's a free podcast, we're not paying for it, but still want to, you know, what I know, right? Free. I'm not getting paid for this. No, no, no. And, and, and the listener, why should you? Because the listeners aren't paying. What about all of our sponsors? Don't they give us money? We don't have any. Who's our sponsor? Where are these sponsors? Right, right, yeah, exactly. I forgot. Yeah, no. We're allowed to have opinions. I forgot. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> We're not being paid. Right, yeah, exactly. So we could keep our integrity. But integrity comes at a cost, and that cost is usually the cost of hosting your website, the cost of registering your domain name, the cost of hosting your podcast, the cost of whatever streaming service or whatever you're using to record the podcast, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Free speech comes with a cost, but those costs haven't gotten out of hand. So anyway, Clemente, why don't you tell us about the card show that you went to uh, this past weekend? Yeah, it was the holiday show at Hofstra University on Long Island outside New York City. Uh, It was a two-day show, Saturday, Sunday. I went on Sunday. Um, I went back and forth about whether I was going to go or not because we were going to get really bad weather. We did get bad weather in, in New York, in the New York area on Sunday. But most of it was in the later afternoon that night. So I went to the show fairly early. Um, I was told that the Saturday show was much busier, I think, because of bad weather had people not interested in going. You know, it was good. Uh, a lot of baseball signers. The only hockey signer was uh, Mike Richter. I didn't see him. I didn't I didn't really bother with the area where they were signing autographs. I wasn't interested in autographs. But I did notice that the admission fee was $15, which is higher than I think it, it's been in the past, which I think is a little steep. And then looking like forward national to, money right there. Yeah. And then looking forward to some of the shows, same organizers are putting together. They're, they have three shows in the first like three weeks of January, including the the Big White Plains show, which is January 19th and 21st, which I'm definitely gonna go to. But as we were saying before the podcast, even I just think that there's too many shows now, and the audience for them is getting thinner. I mean, this is a big show. There's 400 tables, and usually it's pretty packed to the point where, like, you can't walk down the aisles. And I wasn't there long, and it was, you know, there was more room than usual. And I just think because of the holidays and other reasons and lots of shows, I think people are starting to, you know, go to them less. And, you know, some decent hockey stuff there. I, you know, I didn't buy a whole lot, to be honest. Um, I mean, I just came back from the expo, so I felt like I was <laughs> oversaturated with with stuff. But... A lot of people buying wax, I think, because of the holidays, they want to give us gifts and stuff. And it was good. I know I've talked about this before, about too many shows. I really do think, unless you can bring in some interesting signers, there's no reason to go to these shows. And the truth is, a lot of the signers I've seen at, at this show, like, for example, Mike Richter. I mean, I, I saw Mike Richter like three, four years ago at one of these shows. And I got him then, you know. And mm-hmm. then you, had, you had the same baseball guys like Bobby Valentine and all the Mets, Yankees kind of people. So I don't know. I, I just feel like ultimately, long term, I'm not sure if shows, if in 2024 we'll see fewer of them. I, I think we might. I think we're hitting peak shows now. And I think the other thing, too, is like the Expo. I think people are into like traveling for a show now. They want to go to the National. They want to go to the Expo. They want to go to like 
Chantilly or Dallas or the Anaheim one or whatever. Like they want to go to these big shows and people are willing to take a trip. But the ones in your local area, there's so many of them now. It's I wish there were fewer shows and more card shops, you know, but mm. I can't, a, I can't get what point. I want all the time. So well, when you say I don't know what reason there is for the show if if it's not for the autograph guests, I mean you say 400 tables. I assume you'd find a lot of things at the show to buy. I mean, that the current way card shows are set up, you show up to buy stuff. I mean, we talked about wanting to have more like Q and A's and interactive things and, and, and opportunities for fans to get together and stuff. But like, really like you go to a show to buy cards. And so like, I feel like the autograph guests are usually secondary. But At least I, that's my opinion. I agree with you, but I think that the shows are trying to bring in the guests to draw the crowds because a fifteen dollars a pop. I mean, I'm spending fifteen dollars. I haven't bought anything yet, and so that's my take. I think that the autographs are part of the allure. People are like, I gotta get that signed. I gotta get that poster signed. And I'm trying to get the whole team or whatever they're doing. You know, I will say this: Richter was there, and I think the last time I went to a show at Hofstra was maybe a year ago, and they had Stefan Matteau. So they try to bring in the '94 Rangers guys, like. Every once in a while, because the, people are trying to get like like posters signed to the whole team or whatever that is. Like I said, last time I saw Richter sign was like about four years ago. It was right before the pandemic, mm -hmm. so he's not signing all the time, you know. So I think people are interested in that stuff. But the dealers were selling a lot of stuff, like like there's a lot of autograph dealers, like guys who sell pictures and posters because they know it's the holidays and they know like people are looking to buy stuff for their kids or their husband or whatever. You know, I think they did a little bit of business with that, but I just I think there's too many shows. That's my my take. At what I, point does it become watered down, in your opinion? I think we're getting there. So, for instance, like there's uh, quite a few websites that post like shows that are going to be going on and stuff like that. And if you actually look at some of them that only post like what bigger shows are, last weekend. There were 40 across the country that were 150 tables or more. 40. And I think about like, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago, there may have been four. <laughs> so I was going to say, say eight, but yeah, maybe you're right. Like a single yeah. digits. Well, eight if you count Hawaii and Alaska, but, you know, nobody counts those. So I'm just talking continental U.S. Yeah. You're right. It, it's it's kind of like a double-edged sword. So things become watered down, especially when you have these shows that feature dealers that have been there for so long. And we've talked about this before. When inventory becomes stale, and it's like you keep going to these shows and you see these dealers and you see what they have and it's like, oh, it's this guy again. And you look at his table and it's all the same stuff that was there the last time. And it's all in the same spot. It's like nothing has ever moved, nothing's changed, it's not sold, they haven't moved inventory, they haven't flipped what they had, rotated, anything. They haven't done a, a single thing. And it's like, yeah, how many times can you keep walking past the same table filled with slabs? It's like crazy. I think that like, I mean, obviously there's more shows now than there were, you know, four years ago, but I think maybe we're at that saturation point a little bit. Maybe we're feeling that because the investors or the investing has cooled down a bit. Like there are still the guys with the bro cases, they're here to stay. But I feel like a lot of people who jumped in, jumped out almost as quickly. You know what I mean? It's definitely not how it felt like in 2021 or the first half of 2022. Now it seems to be kind of stabilizing. Like I'll give you like one, for instance, I used to do this show in Wisconsin and I would do it almost every month. The first month I did it, I did fantastic. I was just like, oh my God, this is a great show. I'm definitely doing it the next time. Then I went and I did it a second time and I did almost as good. You know, you're not always going to do the same. Sometimes you do a little better, a little worse, but then I kept doing a little less good, a little less good, a little less good, a little less good. And then finally I kind of flatlined. I mean, I did a show like right before the 4th of July and that was just terrible. Because that was like the worst time to do a show. But I was like, yeah, what else am I doing? And I'm not going to be able to do it the next month. And I probably won't be able to do it the next month. So I want to do it this month. And like, 
I didn't do well, but I kind of realized that it seemed that like I was doing great as long as there were things that the investors wanted at this particular show. People were like throwing money to buy those because they were still thinking invest, invest, grade, slab, you know? And I, I feel like once I kind of ran out of that sort of stuff, I didn't do good at the show anymore. So then I stopped doing it. And I kind of feel that that's kind of where we're at. We're like those types who are just kind of like impulse buying everything to grade aren't doing that anymore. They're kind of being a little more selective about what they're going to invest in. And whatever that thing is, I don't have it. So they're not buying it from me. Well, there's also the the people that are just buying and selling like three or four thousand dollar cards. And so like that, even when you go to a fairly big show or medium show, there's a lot of those tables, a lot of those people. And like people like us, just I have to go right past those people and they sell like basketball and football and i'm not interested in any of that so all of a sudden this long list of dealers becomes like shrinks immensely because you're like well this this, this part of the show or these tables aren't for me and like tim said about the the, the slabs and, and the cases you just go right past them because you're like i'm this is not a sport i'm interested in i can't afford any of these anyway i'm not even gonna look so you just do that quick glance and you're like just keep going by mm-hmm but there's a lot of people look, looking to buy and sell. Like that's the thing too that we've been talking about that for years too. Now, people go to the show to sell to dealers who then want to buy and they want to trade, and it becomes this whole thing, you know. And then there's guys who are selling just autograph photos and other things that are not cards, you know, like baseballs and all that. And, and there's still a good market for that. I think people are interested in that stuff, especially as a gift giving thing. But yeah, I think 2024 is going to be more shows than we've ever seen at some point organizers are going to figure out you know what we put the show together a few people showed up it cost more to put on than it was worth we had to scale back but we're not 2024 is going to be the year of fanatics because that's that's when they're going to kick in with their big show that they're playing they're going to invest in these like big regional shows are they going to rename or rebrand existing ones i don't know what they're going to do but they're going to they're going to do something to the show market that may change things it may turn out to be a big success it may be be a big bust i don't know but it is interesting to see where the you know i didn't think we'd ever talk this much about shows in general where they're going to go because there's definitely a changing nature to it i think post pandemic we're all looking to meet with people and hang out and talk cards and talk about the hobby and interact but we may be getting too much of that now you know it's kind of ironic but there's too many opportunities for that. And I don't, you know, I know, I know Sal's going to talk about the show he, he, he went to, he did, you know, Chicago yeah. area alone has a lot of shows and I feel like, but then like people, I, I know people don't live near an LCS. So I'm like, but running an LCS is a lot more time consuming and expensive. Than it is to just show up at a show, throw a couple of cards in a, in a case and then leave running a shop as a business. And that's not easy. Look, the argument's been for a long time that the internet has killed the shops. And right. I, there's so right. many people that love that. They think it's great because let's face it, how many local card shops have we been in over the years, even going back to when we were kids, that people that ran them had no business sense, had oh. no idea how to run a business, right. had no idea how to do any of that. They just, just love sports. I like whatever. cards. I like sports. I'm going to fill a room full of cardboard and people can come and buy my stuff. And it's like, that's not how this, the world is. You got to do something different. You got to bring it's people not, in. It's not build it, they will come. Build it, and no one's coming. Right. And but, I have the benefit of having two complete polar opposite type LCSs in my area. I have one that's the old school. You walk in there, there's a bunch of older guys. They're sitting around talking sports. There's usually an old baseball game on TV. And they're like chatting and making fun of each other and laughing and goofing around and drinking the worst smelling coffee you could ever imagine. And the owner's great. He's super nice. I've known him for many years. This is like his third shop that he's had. He's moved around and stuff. Uh, It's a great place and it gives you that kind of environment. But I've got another one that's a major player in the game, baseball card exchange, that is completely a sterile weird i don't fit in here like a museum this place makes me uncomfortable i don't like it place i still go in there and i'll walk around and i'll look and i'll look at all the wax because they have tons of wax because that's what they're known for 
and it's cool to see all these old boxes and everything. And occasionally I'll pick one up here and there, but mostly I buy supplies there and I get in and I get out and I go on my way. You because picked up, I'm you just picked like up, you picked up a you picked up a case of GI Joe cards there once, right? Um, I did, and um, I I thought they weren't weren't uh, <laughs> I, I, I I I thought they were Pokemon cards. Turns <laughs> out they were GI Joe cards. I was hoping that they were going to be um, Little Mermaid cards, but you know you can't. can't I mean, like, all. look, I know we're talking about this last week. They had the the holiday virtual sports card investor and at one point i only watched bits of it over the two days at one point they said oh we're going to all the card shows around the country because we're buying inventory for our new store in atlanta so he's open jeff wilson's opening a new store in atlanta and they're going to all these card shows around the country and just buying what, what they said was inventory right so they have to fill this gigantic showroom with stuff right and so it makes you wonder, like, who are the kind of people going to shows now to buy stuff? They're buying high end, I'm guessing. They're not just buying junk wax to put in a store, right? Because they probably have, they're probably going to open a store similar to the when I went to Burbank. I went to, I went, I was in California for a work related thing and I just had a day off and I'm like, well, you know, people are going to do like touristy stuff. I'm, I'm going to go to the Burbank store, uh, the big sports store there. And it was amazing. Like, they had basically, these gigantic sections dedicated to different sports. It was like going to a show. Burbank's a crazy place. But it was a shop. And it was and yeah. then they had a room where just they had just commons and wax it just in these gigantic boxes by year. And you can just like finish your sets. It was mostly baseball, obviously. But I was like, this is fun. They had like trade night for kids and kids. I mean, I was like, if I lived near this store, I would never go to a, a show ever. But, you know, not everyone has that. And they have a big mail order business and all that. And they're on eBay. But it's funny you said that the Internet killed the shops. But why didn't the Internet kill the shows? You know, I don't know. Maybe because of the autograph guests or maybe because of fanatics making it. I honestly think it started to. But then COVID hit. And once COVID was over and the boom came back, everybody was like, we got to get in front of people. We need to meet people in person. We need to do this. We need to do yeah. that. And then it sprung back up. I mean, I it's not so. sustainable. We all know that. The hobbies, it's not sustainable at that level. And, you know, whatever Fanatics decides to do, they're going to decide to do it. If it kills the national, so be it. If it becomes the next national, great. If it if it wipes out a lot of lo local smaller shows, I don't see them doing that. Maybe more, like you said, more of the regional type ones may get absorbed into that. I don't know. But it's funny, kind of ironic funny that, you know, we talk about we love the hobby and all this stuff. And yet here we are in 2023 talking about how there's too many shows. <laughs> well, tell us about your show because I mean, yeah. that's it. Yeah. So I went to this thing called the Sport Card Collector Show Chicago. It was a new show. The guy who started it was doing it to raise money for his high school baseball team that he coaches. They were going to have some autograph guests and tables were cheap. They were like 20 bucks each and they were like cheaper if I bought more than one. Now, $20 for a table is great. I mean, the cheapest I've done shows, maybe $25 a table, but usually like $40, $50. So that's kind of like your going rate for the smaller shows. So when you have something like 20 bucks, I'm like, all right, I'll take a chance on it. So. It wasn't well promoted. There wasn't a lot of foot traffic. One of the autograph guests, Chicago Bears player named Andrew Billings, bailed. He just canceled like a day or two before. He told them, oh, it's too far. I don't want to come, right? Or his agent did or whatever. So there was a, a boxer, a former boxer named uh, uh, Angel Manfredi. Uh, there was the former governor of Illinois, Rod Blagojevich, was there and he was just walking around schmoozing with everybody, signing photos and stuff. That's so weird. But this guy who this guy knew these people or he knew like people who knew them or whatever. And then uh and then they had uh Phil Russell of the Blackhawks, a, a former Blackhawks player, played with the team from 72 to 79-ish or 78, was traded to the Atlanta Flames. Then they moved to Calgary. Then he ended up with the Devils later on and then he ended up closing out his career with the Sabres. So not a lot of people were getting Phil Russell's autograph. So I went and talked to him 
for like a lot of the time because there weren't a lot of people at the show. I mean, I made money. I actually did okay because I brought the right things for the right people, but it, it was not by any means a great show. I made one good sale and that pretty much made my show. And it's just like, okay, I can relax now. I'm happy. This is a success, right? But if I didn't sell that one thing that I sold, I would have been crying. I would be like, oh, this show's terrible. But you know what? I've done bad shows before and I'm not dissing this show because I'm going to help the guy promote it and market it because I think I'm good at that stuff. We'll find out. But it was just really cool just getting to talk hockey with Phil Russell because, you know, he had a lot of things to say. And, you know, he he actually remembered me from he did an autograph signing at a local card shop in Chicago called AU Sports. And so when I introduced myself and he said, oh, yeah, I remember you you lost a lot of weight. And I'm like, whoa. He's like, yeah, man. I'm like, you really remember me? And he's like, yeah, a gunslinger never forgets a face. Right? <laughs> I thought that was, nice. that was funny. So this is the kind of show where if it was promoted a little better, it would have been fine. Show in Indiana that I did back in like 21. And the thing about that show is that they had another show in the exact same place the week before and that was like oversaturation because i said to the promoter wait there was a show here a week ago he goes oh yeah that's the guy i used to partner with now he does his own show that competes with my show and i'm like but you're doing them in the same place and you're doing them a week apart from each other and so they basically killed each other because that was oversaturation same place same venue a week apart that's too close i think if you have like a big place like New York or a big place like Chicago, you can afford to have a bunch of different smaller shows kind of around. Well, you're saying there's a show like a week apart. I mean, it reminds me of that Kirby Enthusiasm episode where Larry David decides to open what he calls a spite store next door to this cafe that he hates the guy. So this guy opened, like he started his own spite card show like a week later. You know, like you said, you're going to fragment the audience because people don't know the backstory. They don't care who organizes the show. They just want to go to a show. And so if they're going to go to yours, they're not going to go to the one a week later. I mean, look, there's just so many people collecting cards, right? right. Like, and, you know, at some point, it's not, it's not a finite thing. I mean, at some point it has to, there's like, okay, only this many thousand people care, you know, and even yeah, but care, you know, are not going to go every week. For sure. I mean, you get you get though the hardcore people because I saw people at this show that I've seen at other shows, and even though this was a show that was not well attended, I still saw people that I recognized from other places. You know what I mean? So like the hardcore people, they're gonna go to shows because they're always looking for something different. And they're always looking to find something that they didn't find elsewhere. It's that hope that you find something. If you keep uh, looking, like you'll find something. Yeah, I like to think that we're hardcore, but like at some point you're like, look, I have kids, I have a family, I have like, sometimes you just don't want right. to walk along. Like sometimes a Saturday, you're just like, you know, I just want to stay home, watch TV or watch football on Sunday. Like, you know, like that's the other thing too. These shows oftentimes are happening during like football season on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Sunday, people go on Sunday because they think they're going to get a deal because dealers are wrapping up. But the truth is a lot of these shows once one o'clock kickoff, like all of a sudden the audience drops. They're like, well, I'm going home. I'm watching, I'm watching the Giants. I'm watching the Jets or whatever. Yeah. And it. in the Chicago area, when the Bears are playing, forget it. Yeah. Nobody's I did, doing anything. I did a show way back in 2010 after the Blackhawks won the Stanley Cup. I was like, all right, I think I want to get back into doing card shows, right? Because by then I'd been collecting regularly for about five years and then the Hawks won the cup. And I said, all right, this is where I make my comeback as a card dealer, right? Or a card show guy, right? And I did the show and this again was at Orland Park. And this is when the show was pretty good, but not what it became because of like the pandemic. And I remember like the show was slow. And then I remember that like once the Bears started playing the room just went dead. Yeah. And I want to say it was like a 10 to three kind of show. And I want to say by noon, it was just boom. And by like one 30 people were packing up. It was depressing. I think, I think I paid 40 bucks for an eight foot table. And I think I made 40 bucks. Yeah. And I'm going to paraphrase a conversation that I had about with someone else. Um, my, my buddy Bugsy Malone over here, John mm -hmm. Malone who also went to the same show you did, Clemente. And uh, he said, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but it fits this because it points to 
something else that could be hobby burnout. And we've gotten to the point of every conversation at every dealer table is the dealer is like, I can't pay you comps because I have to make money. And the seller is like, well, I need to make money too. And here's the comps. And they pull them up on their phone. And the dealer's like, you have to come down. And the seller's like, no, you have to come up. Well, And then the dealer's like, well, what else do you have in your bro case? And right. so then they have so, to come up with some other alternative. Yeah. And it's so like the, this back yeah. and forth, back and forth. And it's like. Yeah. So at the expo, I noticed that. It's that, monotonous. Like, like at the expo, I noticed that a couple of times where it wasn't just like, oh, I want to sell you this. And you're like at an impasse. So you, it's over. Like people argue. Like they were arguing. They're yeah. like, no, 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 like, let's get this slab right now and I'll show you what it's worth. And you don't know anything. And I'm like, why are you arguing with this dealer yeah. that he doesn't want the card? Dude, move on. Yeah. And it was very weird, like antagonistic, like, you don't want my card. And then it's like, like they want to make a deal so badly. And I'm like, I didn't come to a card show to watch like adult men argue over. And I'm like, why are you badgering the dealer? Like he's here to sell. He's not here to buy anything technically. I mean, if he's interested, sure. But I think people think card shows are also meant for them. That's what trade night is, I guess. I don't know. But they think it's like this free-for-all trade night where it's like, well, I bring my case. I show you what I have. And then you, we have to make a deal. And I think dealers are like, and, and, and Sal has more experience doing that. It's like, look, I'm looking to make some money here. I'm not just looking to buy. Because if I'm just spending money and I go home, I, I didn't make any money. When I was younger, and I used to go to what is now the Chicago Sports Spectacular, back when it was called the Sun Times Show, and it used to be kind of half comic books and half cards. And I'd go there with my comic books, and I'd go to sell them because I wanted money to buy stuff. And I knew that I was not going to get top dollar. And, you know, I knew the, you know, I worked in a comic book store, so I knew the deal. Like if they were selling, they would use Wizard Magazine for the sell prices or, or overstreet price guide, which we called overpriced price guide, the overstreet price guide. Th those two were kind of like higher. And then the other one, which I can't remember what the other big price guide was, but that one was more conservative in its pricing. So that was the one that they'd always open up and they'd always want to give me low book value. And I would negotiate a little bit, but I understood that they were running a business. You know what I mean? So the way I saw it is if I bought a comic book for a buck and now it was like worth $10 and I got $5 for it, that's fine. I made four bucks. I was happy. I wasn't trying to get $8 or $9, right? And especially if I was selling a quantity of comic books to somebody and walk away with 40, 50 bucks, I'm like, well, okay, now I don't have to carry these books around. I made some money. Everybody's happy, right? But now it just yeah. feels like everybody wants to make that top dollar. People think just because they have a bro case that entitles them to make what it sells for on eBay, or they think just because they have a phone that entitles them to buy the card for what it sells for on eBay. Like one guy, I'll use this card as an example. I had a Braden Shen patch autograph card. And this guy's like, are you taking comps on that? I'm like, I mean, not really. No, that's the price I want. And he pulls out his phone. He's like, well, you want 40 and I there one sold for 25. I'm like, well, that one sold for 25. You can't buy 40, it. <laughs> you can't buy it for 25. Like it's sold, it's gone. You know what I mean? So right. you could buy the one for me for 40, or maybe we could talk a little about that. But he was totally That's not interested. That's what people don't understand. Right. There's one well, less of them and there's one less buyer. Well, right. you know what the market really, has yeah. now changed. Yes. Yeah, my, look, my advice is to people who want to do this is watch Pawn Stars or American Pickers. The, that, those are not card <laughs> programs, but they explain you to you the wiggle room in like, I got to make a profit. If you sell to me, I have to sell it. You know, it's like they bring in the, like a Pawn Stars, they bring in the expert. The guy's like, yeah, it's worth $1,000. The guy's like, how much do you want? I want $1,000. And then the guy goes, well, I, I can't sell it for a thousand if I buy it for you for, for a thousand. It's like simple math. And I don't know why we're, we're in this place, but Shows are becoming a place where I get a front row seat to all this like annoying arguing now. And I, I got to tell you, as a someone who's a collector who just wants to go to a show and enjoy that, it's not enjoyable. I think dealers are not going to be happy because if I was a dealer, I would not want to deal with the public. I think I told Sal that when I at the trade night in Toronto, I was like, how do dealers deal with this? Like people walk up to them and everything is like a negotiation. You know, I don't know. I just feel like. I think it's worse now than it used to be. 
I'm not like pro dealer or anything, but I got to, I got to think that if you're a dealer, this is becoming a really, really difficult business because whether you do it for full time or for fun, because I can't think of any other industry where people demand top dollar for what they have. And then they want to, and then they want to talk you down when they want to buy something from you. So it's like when they're selling, they want to sell high and when they're buying, they want to buy low. Well, it's because of eBay, right? So again, going back to my comic book example, I didn't own a comic book store. I worked in a comic book store. And if I sold my comic books to my boss at the comic store, it would probably be the same thing where he would give me an offer because I understood how it worked. He buys it and then he, he turns around and he, he sells it, right? And the thing is, is that now people say, oh, this is selling for $10 on eBay. I can sell it for $10, right? And they, they think that it's just so easy to do that. And then they don't realize that if they sell it for $10 on eBay, they're really only making about $7.80 because eBay takes their commission, their 10%. So your $10 becomes $9, but then you also get taxed on that $10. No, wait, I'm sorry. Did you charge $2 shipping? You actually get taxed on $12. And then when you pay your taxes, you're getting taxed on the shipping and then you're also paying the tax on the eBay fee. Like they don't like deduct the eBay fee and say, oh, we should really only tax you on $9 because that's what you cleared after our fee. No, you pay taxes on $10 and then the fee comes out of that too. So you're making a $10 thing becomes a $7.50 thing, we'll just say, right? And they don't see it that way, you know? Well, and yeah. But what yeah. you're saying is that a dealer or a shop, even worse, they have overhead, right? So they also have to take that into account. Also, what we're saying here is like, it's super simple. I just wish eBay had a system where you look up the comps and it would, for example, give you the median price. Or maybe it, you know, when I look at comps, what I do is I, I get rid of the highest one and the lowest one. Because in my mind, those might be right. outliers. Right, exactly. You know? Yeah, I mean, that's statistics 101. Right, but no one is applying this. People listening to this right now going like, this is super simple. Why are you talking about it? If it's so simple, why don't I see it in practice at the at the shops mm. or at the at the shows? Really, that's what because the all the people is. out there that run the systems and run the subscription based services like the, your card ladders and your card movers and your whatever card shakers, yeah, movers and shakers movers and, and ladders and, shakers and breakers, and <laughs> shoots and ladders and whatever you want to call them, it's flawed. If you're pulling data from eBay, it is flawed. It's flawed data. It's not vetted. There's errors. Look, you can pull it from, from the other auction houses, like a golden auction or a heritage auction or something. And you can see, this is for auction. It's sold. You can pretty much guarantee it's paid for. On eBay, A, you don't know if it's paid for. B, you don't know if it was shilled. C, you don't know if people pulling all of the market data as a whole is covering everything correctly. There may be, like you said, the outliers. They might be in there. The messed up ones might be in there. How are they also, taking into account the people that spell things wrong in their descriptions right. or put the also, wrong yeah. things, wrong also, keywords or whatever else? It's flawed. All of it is if flawed. Have, if, also, if you have one of those systems where you track prices, isn't it the incentive to have the prices high because that shows a growing business? And why would you pay for this monthly subscription to whatever service to tell you how much cards cost just to find out that cards are dropping in price. Nobody wants that. I mean, I, I'm not saying that's happening, but I do think it has to create this healthy hobby image. Otherwise, what's the point of the whole investor thing? If the whole thing's going to crash, then why, why am I paying $20 a month or $100 a month or whatever it is? I mean, I guess this takes us to stuff like mega bidding or shill bidding. I mean, those are things that, you know, I don't know what happened, but at some point people decided that the Beckett price guide was outdated and it is because it's printed. And even the Beckett price guide, let's be honest, we don't really know how the prices, I mean, when we were in high school, we'd look up the prices and look up for that little, you know, that little, that little arrow pointing upwards. We got all excited, but even that data was collected in a way that was, might've been flawed. We went from that system, which was basically like seven guys traveling the country, looking at shows, talking to dealers and coming with prices to eBay, which is like, just a free for all, everything auction. You know, we don't know if it's fake, it's real, if it was paid for. I mean, if if it's not paid for, eBay should just get rid of it, like take it off. They can do that probably. 
And if eBay wants to get into the card space more, which it seems like they are, they need to become, if, if they're becoming the price guy to the hobby, they need to do more than to be more transparent. Because, I, I, you know, honestly, if they're going to be involved in the, in the hobby, then, and they know their default price guy now, they have to know that. Oh, well, I mean, come on, dude. They have the eBay vault. Right, exactly. eBay, exactly. great, you know, like uh, get authenticity guarantee and all these things that they've done over the past two right. and a half years that are all relating to cards, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. I mean, they, they, yeah. they were the sponsor at the expo. It was the Sport Card yeah. Expo by eBay, you know? I mean, yeah. it was, they're really embracing the whole card space. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, they're going to want to show that stuff is selling for a lot of money. They're, they're not going to want to, like, say, oh, but... That one's a shill bid, and that one never paid, and right. that like, one was. That guy said that he he but he but auctioned that one, he but dialed it, or that guy said my kid did it, or whatever. Right? They're not going to take those off, but yeah. I don't know. At some point, and this is why eBay doesn't sponsor this show. No, but this is why this is, and this is why I think if you're going to be eBay and you're going to put your name on card shows and have big, big corporate whatever and be a big presence at the national and the expo, you, you have to do more because otherwise, I feel like you're part of the problem. We could bitch about eBay and things from now till next week, Tuesday. So before we talk about Leaf hockey from 93, 94, I want to talk about the Leaf continuum print on demand set. They kind of started coming out a couple months ago. So continuum is like this multi-sport set. It's print on demand. The cards are printed on like a nice chromium card stock. They kind of have like that OPG platinum look to them but like the rainbow like the with the rainbow sheen like the rainbow parallels so they're really nice looking cards the only drawback is that there are no team logos because leaf doesn't have a license anymore they're not the same company that they were 30 years ago but they made four different print on demand cards that were hockey related and i was kind of like back and forth like, oh, do I want to buy unlicensed stuff or non-league licensed stuff? But they had a Mike Richter autographed card that was 35 bucks. It's fitting because that was his number on the Rangers, 35. And so I bought that one. And then maybe two weeks later, then they came out with a Joe Sackick one. And, you know, Tim and I were talking about this card. And Tim's like, well, you could get a Joe Sackick card for cheaper than what they were selling this one for and I'm like yeah that's true but I kind of want to support the little guy and I liked the card enough to buy it so the Richter was 35 and then the Sackick was $80 then the next one they came out with was the Stamkos and it was also $80 and I was like ah uh, yeah all right I'll buy the Stamkos just because you know I'm, I'm trying to just buy just the hockey ones because They'll do pickleball, they'll do football, they'll do baseball, they'll do some woman's pole vaulter who they think is like the, the best thing ever. And, you know, she's an attractive woman, but I don't follow pole vaulting, so I'm not going to buy her trading card. And then the last hockey one they came out with was Dominic Hashek. And I'm like, oh, well, hell yeah, that's a great autograph. And that was also $80. So I want to ask you guys, though, we're going to play another guessing game because we got positive feedback about guess the goalie or guess the empty net goal goalie from last week. So I'm going to say guess the print run. So Mike Rick. Well, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this yeah. first. When you yep, said yep. Uh, support the little guy, did you mean Leaf or Joe Sackick? Leaf. Okay. <laughs> Leaf, not not Joe Sackick. I meant, I meant okay. Leaf like trading cards because, like, you know what? I could buy a – Hobby box of Upper Deck Series 1 for like 120 130 or I could buy like two of these autograph cards and it might cost a little bit more. But you know what? I'm, I'm guaranteed an autograph if I buy an autograph, right? So, uh, all right. So first one, Mike Richter, what do you think the print run was on this? In other words, how many people do you think bought this card? I'm not going to answer because you already told me. So. Okay, so you already know this one, so we'll, we'll see if I'm going to say I'm going to say like 150 people. Oh, I'll give you one more guess, and I'm going to say lower. Okay. Wow. Okay. That that's a respectable number, though. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Uh, well, then, uh, eighty-five. Hmm. Thirty-five. And I actually got number thirty-five out of thirty-five. Wow. Yeah. And so then I I messaged their brand manager. Greg this is Sullivan. up there with like top stickers here. We're talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah and I I messaged their Certain brand cards, manager, yeah. and I said, "You only made thirty-five of these." He goes, "Yeah." And I said, and I was, apparently I was the last one to buy one. And he said, yeah, we, we 
give the print run in in the order of that they're that they were purchased because this one I was kind of on the fence of like eh, I don't know kind of waited to the last minute before I bought it so yeah thirty five okay then the next one that came out was Joe Sackick care to guess the print run on not small Joe Sackick wow Oof, Joe Sackick uh... keep in mind it was an eighty dollar card. So it's more expensive and Joe Sackick in my mind, like 25 cards. Tim, what do you think? Did I tell you this one yet or no? I'm pretty sure you told me that one too. Okay. So Clemente, you're close. It was out of 20. Yeah. And I these got are... number one out of 20. So I was so, the first one to buy it. So these Apparently. are like, I mean, I, I'm just saying these, these low numbers are pretty good if for the prices, but. I mean, I just wanted to have the autograph, and I have well, all four of them in a row on, like, my display shelf. So yeah. I, I kind of like the way they look together. Right, but right. I was just like, all right, this is cool. All right, third one, Steven Stamkos. Well, Stamkos is a much better player and someone who's current. So I don't know. I think it's going to be higher. Um, but it, well, also $80. Mm -hmm. Also $80. I say 50 of those. Tim, what's your guess on this? Because I don't think I told you this one. On the Stamkos? Yeah. Mm, let's go with 14. Okay. And Clemente, wow. you said what? I said 50. Okay. There were 21. Wow. Price is right rules. Yeah, Good price work. is right rules. And I actually got number two out of 21. And I was like, damn it, I didn't get number one. Okay. Whatever. Okay. And then the last one, Dominic Hachek. Oh, boy. Also $80. Well, I have to think these are low because, I mean, like, given the pattern here, I'm going to say 30 Okay. And Tim? I think he's right because I think you told me that. 32 Okay. And okay. I got number two out of 32 So, well, again, I, I, I right after getting the first three wrong because I, yeah. I'm trying to get a feel for what this print run looks like. Yeah, no, Here's Absolutely. But here's something you have to understand about this, okay? One of Leaf's things that they do is this is this print on demand stuff. And they do it for a lot of their things. So this continuum series with all of the autographs that are out there, they make these available. And really, think about it in the grand scheme of things, right? You got baseball, you got football, you got basketball. Hockey's always like down here. And like people don't pay attention other than us. You know, our group of people, our sphere, those listening to us, we're paying attention to hockey. Now, throw in the fact that Leaf doesn't have a license. So over the years, Leaf has become kind of a niche type thing. So if you see some of the stuff that they put up in this series, they sell a lot of them. Like we're talking prints in the hundreds. You mean like not the guys, hockey like, though? You mean like for boxers or wrestlers that kind of thing? Like boxers, wrestlers, or you know, Sal brought up the pickleball stuff and the pole right. vaulters and all of that kind of stuff. You can't find this stuff anywhere. Nobody's making cards of these kinds of things. So right. whether even if it's not for you, you have to understand from a company standpoint and from doing this, there's a market for something. So they're gonna figure out what it is and they're gonna print it. I mean, let's be honest. Has everything been in the best taste? No. Some of the stuff that they've come up with has been questionable. But from a sports standpoint and competition type things and stuff, you know, they're putting out things that no other company is doing and there's no access to it. Their pickleball stuff, I, I see it pop up all the time on eBay and some of it sells for way more than you would think it would. It's popular. And it's kind of crazy. But it's super popular. So like when you go back to that, knowing what's actually going to sell, it's more of the niche type stuff. You throw in a few hockey names here and there. I don't think the hockey people are even looking or paying attention to Leaf other than maybe with some of the releases like Lumber Kings or Pearl or the big releases that are boxes that you can open. I think, I think you're right because if those same four cards Sal mentioned were on Upper Deck's website, or print on demand, those numbers would be way bigger. But those prices would oh, be yeah. a lot higher too, because the prices would be way higher. Double, triple potentially. Yeah, like, yeah I mean, yeah. Yeah. if Upper Deck was just saying, "Hey, you know what? We're going to do an NHL Legends set print on demand," and 
Card number one is Mike Richter. I don't think the price would be $35. It'd probably be probably be like $75 or $65 because they'd have to pay for the league license. Or, you know, even if it was like 50 bucks, I'd buy it. You know what I mean? Like if they used a better photo, I probably would have been more inclined to buy it like right away versus kind of waiting till the end and then buying it. I mean, I guess that's the thing. Like I like the Topps hockey stickers, even though there's a lot of problems with that set. Not the Topps now stickers. I mean, just like, well, those two, I was supporting those the first year they came out. It's just, it's like, if you like collecting hockey, collect hockey. I mean, collect what you like, as we say, but like, there's more options in upper deck. If you go, man, I really want a really nice Jersey card. You go to like president's choice. They got some really nice stuff. And if you could live without a team logo, I think you'll be really happy. I mean, I got this great Jeremy Roenick card that I just found in my collection again the other day. It's like from part of a fight strap and it has like the button snap on it. So the card is like an inch thick because it's like a thick card because it's got the strap mounted into it, but then it's got like the button like protruding out of it, you know? And I mean, cool stuff like that. I mean, you're not going to get that in a, in a pack of upper deck series one, you're going to yeah. get other stuff in a pack of upper deck series one. So you got to decide like what's right for you. And so I looked at these cards and I said, all right, the hashtag would be badass with a Sabres logo on it. But you know what else is badass that there's only 32 of them. And I have one of those, you know, and it's a chromium card and it looks really nice. And, and you, but yeah. you mentioned part of the issue, which is no license. And there's this, feeling in the hobby that between no license and it's not pack pulled, then the value is lower than if it was those two things. And you see that with all the sports as well. Now I do some soccer collecting and collectors from around the world don't care about that. Like they think a top snob card is just as good as like a pack pulled card because they don't have that stigma that maybe the American hobby has cultivated over the last three decades, potentially. The stigma was caused by the price guide. The price guide, Beckett right. decided it needed to draw up some rules somewhere long ago. And then right. everybody decided to like adhere to the rules. Like Tim, you refer to people calling it the Bible and they pull out their Bible and they thump their Bible, whatever, right? Like they have to check the Holy scriptures, right? And I love arguing with people about like what's a rookie card and what's not a rookie card, you know, like one baseball card, former podcaster who collects Mark McGuire. And I always like to tease him. I'm like, yeah, the Mark McGuire rookie, that's from 85 tops. I had that card. I remember selling it for $9 when I was like 15 I mean, years the old. USA, the USA baseball one. The USA baseball one. He's like, no, the McGuire rookie's 87 tops. I'm like, nah, that wasn't right. his first year, but he's not wearing an, he's not wearing. And it was not part of a pack, right? Because some of them were in these traded sets or whatever it was. And they, those were not. Impact. Right. So they came up with this whole XRC designation, right. extended rookie card. But then like you'll have like numbskulls who will argue like, oh, well, it can't be a rookie card if it pictures more than one player. I'm like, really? Because Nolan Ryan's rookie card pictures him with another player. And everybody accepts that as Nolan Ryan's rookie well, that's card. Because, right. Those baseball cards had like three faces on them or four of them. and Two to four. Yeah. Depending right. on what year. Right. Yeah. So. But yet late 90s, early 2000s, oh, that's not a rookie card. But or you need the XRC designation today because you need it today, not because of the, of the pack stuff, but you need it because it's 3,700 sets and everybody has 20 million rookies. Right. Kyle Bedard will have a million rookies. And so you have to decide, well, what's his rookie card? And it's like, well, it depends. Is it is it flagship? Is it SP authentic? Is it, you know, whatever. And then it never ends. And so that's why the XRC designation works today for that reason. But I know what you're saying. Originally, it was meant because of this whole pack versus traded set or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's ex that's exactly it. So, oh, I thought it was funny when I did that show. Somebody was selling like boxes of Series 1 and they had like Upper Deck Series 1. And then underneath it, they wrote Connor Bedard RC. And I just kind of laugh to myself and I'm just like, yeah, one in every two cases, but sure, you know, whatever. And maybe not even really his rookie card. I mean, I don't know. You could argue. Uh, the people what selling it for $800 are going to tell you that it's his first officially licensed pack pulled card. Which is true. It doesn't make it $800, but it's true. Yeah. Pack pulled, not to be confused with pulled pork. That's something else.
Hey, speaking of packs and pulls and cards, I want to talk about the 93-94 Leaf Hockey set. Because is that I've been coming th- out this week? No, that came out 30 Whoa. years ago. Oh, oh. Yeah, I'm feeling nostalgic for 30 years ago because I'm at that age where I can feel nostalgic for 30 years ago because I loved collecting 89, 90, 90, 91, of course, was like ridiculously cool. 91, 92 was also ridiculously cool. And that was the year I got my first job. So I had like money to buy cards, albeit low income, but still like money to buy cards. 92, 93 was just such a weird year for like card collecting for me, just like where I was in life. I didn't have as much disposable income. And that was like that weird year where like Pro Set only did like series one. But like 92, 93, I didn't collect that much. And in 93, 94 was like that perfect storm year for me where like I was working, I had disposable income, I didn't have any bills. I didn't start college until the spring semester. So like that fall of 93, I was working a lot at the comic book store. I was buying a lot of cards. And the thing I remember about Leaf was that they just looked awesome. The design was awesome. Mario Lemieux was the spokesperson, which made sense because if Upper Deck is like Coca-Cola and Gretzky was the spokesman for Upper Deck, then Leaf was like Pepsi. I don't want to say Lemieux is like the number two player and Gretzky's the number one player. I mean, you could rate him whichever one you want. But you basically, you had like these two competing card companies and these two just like the best two players in the game. So it just made sense that like Gretzky was endorsing maybe the most popular hockey card set, but Lemieux was endorsing what I think was probably the best hockey card set just like design wise, everything about the set was just beautiful. I can keep going on. So I'm going to shut up and let you guys talk. For I mean, look at this point, you didn't have a whole lot of the advanced technology in the printing at that point. I mean, yeah, upper deck kind of broke the mold with what they did coming into the scene, but everybody else took it from there. Yes. Like this leaf set, when you look at it, I mean, these are super premium cards for the time frame. These you know, borderless action photos, mm-hmm. UV coding, foil mm-hmm. stamping. I mean, they had all of that. Oh, and the little hologram, the little holographic logo on the back, yeah. the like anti tamper proof yeah. logo. But like when you turned it, it was like that rainbow foil. And not to mention, I'm just going to bring this up now because it needs to be mentioned up front because it's such a great feature. I loved the card backs, which had the player cut out and superimposed in front of something that had to do with the city that he played in. So here, like, I'm just... A different photo, too. Oh, a different photo of the player, yes. But, like, you know, if it was, like, a Chicago Blackhawks player, sometimes you get, like, a shot of, like, the Chicago skyline. If it's a New York Rangers player, you get, like, sometimes the Statue of Liberty. If it's a, a Flyers player, you'd get, like... The Liberty Bell. I mean, and they would vary them. They weren't always the same one, as as far as I recollect. No, they aren't the same because they're they're different. So if you look at different players from the same team, they'll mm-hmm. have different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Like the Chelios card doesn't have doesn't have Chicago skyline. You should know the Chelios card has like the Wrigley Building in the background. Not only do they have different back pictures than the front, so so you're talking two different photos that have to be licensed out here, right? You've got Mm -hmm. the action shot on the front. You've got sometimes an action shot on the back, sometimes just the player standing there, whatever it is, plus the design background. I mean, if you made these cards today, I can't imagine what this would cost to put these out. Like these, these have got to be like one of the most expensive produced cards that, that there was at the, especially at the time. Well, like you said, Upper Deck raised the bar, and then all these companies are trying. I mean, like I, I like I didn't buy this these cards at the time. I was buying Tops Premium, and if you look at Tops Premium, it's the same thing. Now I think these cards are nicer than Tops Premium, but like the Premier. back is it has, Premier. I'm sorry, sorry, it's okay. Has the, has the has the photo in the back, and it has only one year's worth of stats, not not the whole like you know career, and so they were all aiming to do the same thing. Now I think Leaf did it better probably than anybody else that year because they you know everyone had up their game now you're saying this set would cost a lot of money if it was made today but today it's like even more hyper with swatches and autographs and all that stuff so how pretty the card is is kind of a 
secondary thought. Like I know everyone loves upper deck flagship, but I think every year it looks pretty much the same. I think you from know. a production standpoint, they wouldn't necessarily cost more to make because they do all these things now. You do have full bleed on the front or full bleed photos. Well, licensing the photos that, that yeah, means. the licensing and and of course the 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 cost, the costs associated with, with licensing from the league and from right. the players association and then using two photos instead of one photo. That's why a lot of times you get cards that use the same photo because they might just say, we're going to license this photo to use on trading cards. And then they use it on five different trading cards. Right. You know, another thing I'm just going to point out really quick. Uh, yeah. There's gold foil stamping for the leaf logo for the player's name on the front. There's also this diagonal stripe. I'm a sucker for diagonal lines. I love diagonal lines because they imply motion. And so you get that diagonal line on the front and on the back. This is like what I wanted stadium club cards to look like. If you think of like those early 90s Leaf baseball sets were nice, right? Like you had stadium club baseball was nice because baseball is usually photographed outdoors. You get better color. You get better lighting. Hockey's photographed indoors. It's a harder sport to photograph. So like 91, 92 and 92, 93 oh. top stadium club, oh. not so great. Yeah, those photos are like for straight out of like the 1970s sets mm -hmm. where everything in the background, it was like, did you take this photo like before the guy came and flipped the light switch on or what's going on here? But you look at these 93, 94 leaf cards. I mean, these were just nicer than, I mean, upper deck, I still, you know, in my ranking of all 93, 94 sets, I still said upper deck was the best set that year, but for other reasons, just from like a design standpoint alone, this was, I feel like this was the best set. Like I love Fleer power play. Like the way I ranked them, upper deck was number one. Fleer power play was number two, even though they're tall cards and people hate tall cards. And then this was like number three. If this set was bigger than upper deck, I probably would have ranked it higher. And if it had more rookie cards in it or more good rookie cards. So let me just give a quick breakdown of the set. So there are 440 cards, 220 in series one, 220 in series two. You got 14 cards per pack. There were inserts. There were 10 freshman phenoms, 10 gold leaf all-stars, 15 gold leaf rookies, 10 Patrick artists, 10 Mario Lemieux collection, 10 painted warriors, which featured goalie masks and a little like witch doctor mask as the logo, which probably wouldn't fly today, probably get canceled. And then 10 studio signature cards, which I think were the best insert of the whole series because it had like a player superimposed in front of their logo and it had their autograph in like a rainbow foil. But yeah, so, okay, it was rainbow foil. And then like the gold leaf all-stars were two-sided cards that pictured a player on one side and then like a counterpart on the other side. One card has like Chris Chelios on one side, Larry Murphy on the other side. The other one has Timu Solani on one side and Brett Hull on the other side. So that gives you the idea, like Gretzky and Gilmore, Bork and Coffey, Barrasso and Wah. You know, I think it's first team, second team all-stars. Tim, do you remember, you bought some of these back in the day. Do you remember what they cost per pack? I want to think they were like $2, $2.50 a pack. Does that sound about right? Um, It could be. I, yeah. I, mean, I, I, can't, I can't think of what, what the price tag was on them. I do know that James Way, there's an old school place that doesn't exist anymore. Yep. So there was a James Way that was near where I lived that had these in a jumbo pack version. Okay. So it was like, I don't remember how many cards you got in a pack, but we always thought we were getting a heck of a deal with those, those jumbos. Mm -hmm. Although they had less inserts. I will say that. But I bought a ton of this stuff. I was looking online just now. You get a whole box now on eBay for forty dollars. So, if you're interested, I mean, you, you can, but if you sounds like a fun fun rip if you got nothing to do. If you want a bunch of brick cards, sure. Yeah, I can't okay. imagine these are going to come apart very easily. I'm going to tell you this right now. I liked these cards so much that when I bought them back in the day, I actually put them all in penny sleeves. I put them all in penny sleeves because they cost more money. You know, like 92, 93, 93, 94, like score, if I bought any, no penny sleeves, right? 
All my old pro sets, I never bothered to penny sleeve them unless it was a star card. Even the upper deck cards, because I just had so many of them. But like 93, 94, I put my stadium club cards and my um, leaf cards in sleeves because I wanted to protect them. They were full bleed cards and I was paying more money for them per pack. I mean, even if I was paying two bucks a pack, I mean, they were more than a dollar a pack because Upper Deck was like a dollar a pack. So I want to say they were like in the neighborhood of like maybe a dollar fifty or two dollars a pack. I don't think they were two, but dollar fifty could be. Could be. I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, I want to say like Fleer Ultra might have been a dollar forty nine or something in ninety two, ninety three, but I honestly don't remember. I wasn't like documenting it back then like I do now, but. Yeah, I took care of these. And you're absolutely right. They do brick because I remember in the early 2000s, I was buying a lot of these sets like 94, 95, 95, 96 Leaf and Fleer Ultra and like whatever sets I could get. Because back then, those sets you could get for like four or five dollars each, but they'd be bricked. You know, they weren't yeah. severely bricked. You could still peel them apart with little to no damage. But yeah. Now I would be really suspect of buying a sealed box. In fact, that show that I went to on uh, Saturday, there was a guy selling boxes of Series 1 and Series 2 Leaf 93, 94 for like 45 bucks a box. And I just thought, you know, if I bought those, I would just keep them as boxes and not open them because you don't know what you're going to get. And that's exactly well, what I would do with these if I was to buy one too, because 30, 40, 50 bucks for this. Yeah, cool. You bust it open. Anything made that's 30 years old that's got UV coating on it, you're you're up the creek and you're taking your life in your own hands by opening that and expecting well, something out of it. Again, that's the shame of these mid-90s cards. I think the, most of them, a lot of them had UV coating. And now if you want to go back and try to buy these or finish a set or even like in my case, I never bought these, like buy a box, it's not really a possibility because mm -hmm. I said like it, if they're going to be bricked, and they're going to tear and rip, then you're not going to get anything out of it. So it's kind of a shame. I mean, the, the next best thing is to buy a collated set or something that someone put together that's not in the original packaging. I'd like a box of Series 1 and a box of Series 2 just for the cover art. Those um, Glamour Shots photos of, of Mario, the one on Series 1 where he's penchantly sitting there on a bench with his arms folded and or his hands folded and he's kind of just looking at the camera wondering, you know, why did I sign up for this? And then the, you look at him on the series two and he's just, he's holding his stick double fisted, you know, ready to like club somebody over the head with it, preferably Adam Graves. But that's just my opinion. They're cool photos. And to go along with that and, I don't know if you brought that up is the fact that they put in the Mario Lemieux collection cards as inserts. Um, so there is a whole entire insert set devoted to super Mario in the set. They're pretty cool cards. I mean, they basically, it's a retrospective of his, of his career going all the way back to when he was drafted and, and came into the league up into the point of the release of the, of the cards now they don't really get into a whole lot on the back of like his health problems and all of that stuff but they do definitely do a pretty good job of giving you a snapshot of what his career looked like up to that point they're great looking cards they use really good photos that's one of my favorite insert sets they have a card that i love it's the second one or third one rather uh yeah third one not has... counting the header uh yeah okay Hutter's the first one I guess and then there's one of him with uh his junior with, team and then uh it's the next one that has him standing between, with Olchuk yeah Olchuk and uh so he's standing between Eddie Olchuk and Kirk Muller so those yeah. are the top three picks you had Lemieux go first overall Kirk Muller goes second overall Eddie Olchuk go third overall Lemieux's not wearing his Penguins jersey because he refused to put it on until he right. had some sort of deal worked out with them, which is kind of a bummer because it's a cool photo, but it's in black and white. I wish it was in color, but you know, back then they were still shooting black and white because it was cheaper. Well, and I think that's I think that's also the um what do they call it? The wire photo that they use. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Could part be. of the reason why it's black and white. But yeah, that is a cool photo, and you're right. He didn't he didn't put on the jersey because uh, 
there could have there there could have potentially been an issue mm -hmm. <laughs> with that whole thing. But do you want to? They worked it out. Elaborate on out. that or no? Well, I mean, he, you know, look. If you have the opportunity of uh, getting arguably the best player in the draft up to that point. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, okay. The people are going to argue, like you said earlier, over who's better, Lemire or Gretzky. Well, Gretzky wasn't drafted, so there you go. Right, um, yeah. Yeah. Chances are, if you have the first pick in the draft, your team wasn't very good. So, honestly, if you're like this phenom, do you really want to go to a team that's going to be trash and garbage? And look. You know, here's a Canadian kid that barely speaks English. What the heck does he want to do going to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania? I mean, really? He had options. So that was the thing. It was never known for sure that he was actually going to play for the team. Like I said, they worked it all out, and, you know, the rest is history. So not only did he bail the team out at that point by deciding to sign with them and become a Pittsburgh Penguin, but he bailed them out many times, pulling them out of bankruptcy multiple times and saving the franchise multiple times. So, yeah. So uh, there was an opportunity to get autographed Lemieux cards in packs of Leaf, although I never pulled one. And Me I, neither. Yeah, I've seen them like every now and then pop up on eBay, but I've never purchased one. Me neither. And I don't know that I've ever seen one in person out of this set. Would you guys consider this still the junk wax era? Because this is when you see inserts in the 90s and mid-90s become a bigger thing. And so this set kind of seems like the end of the junk wax, or maybe it is in the middle of the junk wax. What do you guys think of that? I mean, from a production standpoint, yeah. I mean, I think it would still fall in that. If we're going to call that an era rather than a product thing. Yeah. I mean, it's a bell curve. It's not like a clip. Yeah. Right. So I wouldn't like, necessarily consider this a junk wax product, but I would definitely say it comes from that same era because, yeah, they were still overproducing this stuff. And one thing, if I recall, there weren't pack odds for a lot of these inserts. They just said randomly inserted. Mm -hmm. And even back then, if you think of the stuff that was serial numbered in the 92, 93, 94 time frame, I mean, people were ecstatic pulling cards that were numbered out of 10,000. 20,000, 50,000. Right. I mean, that was something rare. You're producing obviously... millions, 10,000. Yeah. Is pretty rare. <laughs> right. Right. It's all relative to the size of the massive print run. So, yeah, I would say these still fall in that that era, but just because of the product itself and, and what it is and what it offered, I don't know that I would call this a junk product. I'm changing the subject here, but like 92, 93 Fleer Ultra had Jeremy Roenick autographs. And I find those on eBay every now and then. And those are just basically the Roenick inserts that are autographed. And then they have a Fleer Ultra logo like pressed into the card. Like they use like a stamper to like press it into the card. You can't really see it unless you like look closely and like turn it and see like the light reflect off of it. But yeah, that's the thing. Like back then there was no like, there were no odds. Because it wasn't considered gambling. I mean, now they need to tell you the odds and they need to give you that chance to, uh, you know, send your name for a chance to win an insert card. Have you ever done that? Like where Upper Deck will like give you an address? The NPNs? I've never done The one. NPNs, yeah. And I know one time they sent me, it was in like the late 2000s, they sent me, uh, they just said, congratulations for winning or being a winner in our daily NPN program. And it was like, a short print card from like a set, but it wasn't anything special. It was just something that you might get one in every 50 packs or whatever. You, you know what I mean? Like it was just that, that, that sort of thing. So yeah, I mean, back then there were no, no rules, no odds, you know, now they have to kind of tell you that, you know, one thing I want to mention really quick though, just looking at a few more of these card backs and like the backdrops, like, the Buffalo Sabres players on the backs of their cards, a lot of them are in front of the Niagara Falls, which is just awesome. And then the San Jose players, like behind them are like the California redwood trees. I'm sure there's some forest or something like in particular, but like 
that's just what they are, like those big freaking trees. Tampa Bay, I'm looking at, you know, there's like, of course, like a building, but then there's like some palm trees. And then like, you know, with like Anaheim, you have like the Pacific Ocean and like, looks like it's at sunset. So, I mean, they're really just cool looking cards. Like if you think of like Hometown Heroes from Upper Deck, remember those in like 05, 06, 06, 07, where they had like the player and then they, it was a, they were horizontal cards and they had like the city cityscape behind them. This is kind of like the precursor to that. Yeah. The, um, I forget what year those MVPs, they did them a couple years, but yeah, I have a Bobby Orr autograph that we pulled out of a box that has that. Oh, so, nice. Yeah. Those background photos, I, I just think they're, sometimes I think the back photo is better than the front. You're talking about just the overall presentation? Yes. Not necessarily the photograph itself. Just the way it looks is better than a lot of the fronts, even the even the photo. If you think of like the the metal universe sets. Yep. Where they're all goofy, weird looking backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Like that's something you wouldn't expect to see on the card, Mm -hmm. probably in 1993, 94, which made it so interesting. So I think in a lot of cases, the backs look better than the fronts. And the back looks like the front of an insert card, basically. Yeah. 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 I mean, the front the fronts are good because they're good action photos. They're colorful. They're in focus. Oh. But the back just brings it to, like, a different level. I mentioned earlier the drawback was, like, the lack of rookie cards. There's 29 rookie cards in the set. I guess the best three would be Jason Arnott, Jocelyn Tebow, and Darren McCarty, okay, yeah, there's Damian Rhodes, there's Darren Mattley, there's um, 20-ish others. I think Jeff Chance is in there, Blackhawks player. Like, But there's no, like, real big names because, like, Upper Deck had it figured out where they were like, we're going to do the World Junior Championship, and that's how we'll get guys, you know, a year or two before they make their NHL debut. Because at this point, they couldn't just – put minor leaguers in like score did in 90, 91, or they couldn't do like certain prospects or draft picks. They just kind of had to do either, you know, if the guy played in the league, they could put them in, in. And a lot of times you'd get guys like, like 91, 92, and they included Dominic Hashek because he played five games in 90, 91. Well, everybody included Hashek in 91, 92, well, but you get this, the idea. This is before the rules because Kind of, yeah. Guys drafted in 93 are not in this set. What's that? The guys drafted in 93, at least towards the top, are not in that. Because wouldn't Chris Pronger be in this set, or was he already in it the previous years? Well, Pronger had a rookie card in 92-93 as part of the World Junior Championship. That's how they got around it, right? So, So, I mean, Pronger was in 93-94, Leaf, and I think he is, at least in Series 2, because that's when he came into the league. He yeah, like, wouldn't be his rookie card. Yeah, like Rob Niedermeyer, he had a card like that year too, I think, and he, but he, he got drafted in 93. Yeah, so like Upper Deck kind of played spoiler in like 90-91 right. where they had like Pavel Bure and Felix right. Potvin, although he was drafted in 90 as well. But like they kind of played spoiler with like these um, World Junior Champion inserts where they they'd play and then they'd end up getting drafted and then they'd crack an NHL lineup and you'd be like oh yeah that guy oh yeah he Paul Korea rookie of the year in uh what 94 95 but has a rookie card in 92 93 upper deck or if you really want to get pedantic 91 92 upper deck world junior championship Czechoslovakia set that was only sold in Czechoslovakia Yes, I have the set. It's basically like the 91-92 subset of World Junior Championships, but it's like expanded to like 90 cards or 100 cards or something, right? So people won't count those as rookie cards because, yes, they're pack pulled, but no, they weren't sold in the U.S. So that that, that doesn't count. But, you know, hey, if you want, uh, if you really want Paul Korea's first ever licensed trading card you could get it in the 91 92 upper deck czechoslovakia world junior championship set so yay what makes me think that these boxes would cost more if there were some top rookies in them too right yeah that's that's the problem is that like if you bought that sealed box the only real big hit you could hope to get would be a mario lemieux autograph because all the other cards are are attainable yeah 
yeah, they're all attainable. I mean, I only bought these boxes and packs. Not really boxes, but packs. We couldn't afford because, boxes back then. Right. I only bought packs because I was trying to get all of the Alexander Dag cards I possibly could. Yeah. That was the well, only reason for me. Was it the PC back then? Is that what it was? Oh yeah. I mean, he I mean, was he, he was yeah. the Connor Bedard of that time. You were, <laughs> yeah. He only was you were the hot putting, guy. Only you weren't spending eight hundred dollars for his like first cards, you know, which right. is a difference I, for that. I yeah. wanted to. Right. Car dealers certainly wanted to. They banked yeah. on this guy being the biggest thing ever, and well, he turned out to be the one of the biggest draft busts of all time. Well, here, just to give a little context, so we talked about those studio signature series. So the players in the studio signature series are from roll, Doug Gilmore, Pat Falloon, Pat LaFontaine, Wayne Gretzky, Steve Eiserman, Patrick Waugh, Jeremy Roenick, Brett Hull. Eric Lindros and Alexander Daig. Yeah. So they really, you know, they really kind of shoehorned him in there. And, and Pat Flew but every, as well. Flew, yeah. yeah. It, and every manufacturer was like, was trying to shove him down everybody's throats because you look at any of the products from that time. I mean, he still hadn't played a game. So right. his stats on the back were does not have stats or they'd put his like Victoriaville stats or, or right. whatever. Yeah. So, like, there there was nothing. And, like, Donruss, for instance, you mentioned Chris Pronger. So, 93-94, Donruss had a card. It was a draft pick card. And it had Chris Groton, uh, Dag, and Pronger all on it together. Mm-hmm. If, you remember, if you remember that card where they're all, like, leaning in, like, hey, this is my high school photo. You mm-hmm. know, that kind of thing. But, yeah, he was, like, everybody's got to get him in the product. Like, he's going to be – he's he's it. Like, that's the guy. and. I mean, it was he was shoved down our throats at that point. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, he, that's why he, I said he was the Bedard of the time. He was the McDavid. He was the Crosby. He was the Matthews. But guess what? He didn't pan out to be even a one tenth of a percent of any of those guys. He had a long NHL career. I'll give him that. Penguins legend, by the way. Um, but the hype wasn't there. There was no backing it up at all. Anyway, not to talk about hijack the program about Alexander Dag, but anyway. Yeah, no, that's okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, overall, I say, like, if you're somebody who likes scooping up sets from the 90s, this is definitely one worth getting just for the aesthetics of it. I mean, it's a nice-looking set. You know, that's the funny thing is that, like, there's, like, tons of Hall of Famers in this set. It's not really, like, a super valuable set because – as we said, it was printed in by the truckload, but maybe less truckloads. I mean, it's not as easy to find as say like 9091 pro set. Like if you buy, remember those like Fairfield repacks where it'd be like 250 hockey cards for 999. And I'd buy one of those and it'd be like all pro set, all Bowman, all score for like 9091. And then like a handful of cards from like 2010 and really, you would not find any, like, 93, 94 cards in there. If you did, maybe a few upper deck ones, because those were really popular. But, like, this isn't, like, the kind of thing that you, like, find every day. But it's not hard to find. So, I mean, if you're only collecting for value, you're not listening to this show. You Ain't know? that the truth? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's to make fun of us later on. And if you want to, just please tag us so that we know that you're making fun of us. So that we can be Yeah, like, let us in on the joke because we want to laugh too. Yeah, I mean, uh, you got to laugh at yourself if you're going to laugh at others, right? Yeah, Hall of Famers, just the base cards. There's 62 Hall of Famers in, the, in just the base cards. It's ridiculous. Yeah. 62. Yeah. That's, That's more than 10%. That's like 15% of the set is, is of Hall of Fame players. I mean, there's a couple checklists. But, that have a Hall a couple, of Famer on the front. Yeah, yeah, and there's a couple award winner cards. But other than okay. that, I mean, so if you weed those out, I mean, you're still talking 55 Hall of Famers. Yeah. So. You know, another thing they did, too, is like 93, 94, they didn't do any Ducks or Panthers in Series 1 because they wouldn't have had any action shots of them. So all the Ducks and Panthers were put into Series 2. 
because I guess series one, it would have just been them standing on the front. Just here's them standing. And then here's them standing again on the back, but you know, with the Florida skyline in the background or whatever. Right. So it wouldn't have been that cool. So I, I thought that was a good choice to like wait for series two and then put them in that way. Cause I remember like 92, 93 tops, like just totally blowing it with like the senators and the lightning they didn't even bother like doing a series two with updated player photos. So by 93, 94, I mean, all the companies were like, you know what? We really need to do a series one, series two. I mean, that was the first year upper deck did series one, series two, because you had these expansion teams coming in and people didn't want to wait a whole year before they got expansion team cards. So just thought that's another interesting tidbit how they did it right for these cards. And if a guy was signed in the off season, like they didn't put him in series one, they waited until series two and they put him in. Like one thing I just checked really quick, like Dennis Savard played 92, 93 in Montreal. And in 93, 94, he went to Tampa Bay. And I'm like, oh, is he in series one and in series two? Nope, he's just in series two because he signed in the summer with Tampa Bay. So they didn't bother including him in series one. So the selection was on point there. Well, and the other thing, the Panthers and the Ducks are the only two that have checklists. I guess it'd be a team card, not a checklist. It's a team card, yeah, because it has like a... Got the logo on the front and like a little blurb about the team. Being the logo is like three-dimensional and it's like flying in. It's got like a motion blur. It's flying in and then on the back, it's got like the state ghosted in the background. And then, yeah, it's it's cool. I mean, stuff like this was cool, right? Like this was like cutting edge for the time. Like to get something kind of in the moment was pretty cool back then. Well, I should point out that the players on the Rangers on this, on this, in this set are the ones that won the cup that year. So that's so right. As a Rangers fan, I'd be remiss not to mention that. So, so that makes that set even more interesting for me all these years later. Yeah. It'd be, I mean, that'd be kind of a cool team set to have, right? Yeah, like, just, yeah, exactly. Just, just, just the Rangers set. Exactly. Yeah. Can I, um, can I bring something else up about this set? Absolutely. One of the inserts is called, the hat trick artists, and I've always had an issue with this insert set, and here's why. Arguably, the best card in this set is the title card. So if you have this set, you'll know well, what I'm talking you. about. But oh. if you don't, that's the Mario Lemieux card that on the back, it explains what a hat trick is and what the history of the hat trick is. That would be the card, right? So the rest of the cards are all like normal insert cards. They have the player action shot doing whatever. It says hat trick artist in the corner. But the title card has Mario Lemieux standing in front of a weirdly lit rink with a bunch of hats thrown on the ice, and he, including one that he is holding. Now, if you look closely at this card, you'll notice that these hats, the ones that are on the ice, specifically are all fedoras and the one that he's holding in his hand is a top hat so i don't know how many hockey games you guys have been to and even in 92 or 93 or 94 but when somebody scores a hat trick and you throw your hat i'm not tom landry at a hockey game so i'm not wearing a fedora nor am i a 1970s hockey coach wearing a fedora nor am I there in a tuxedo wearing a top hat. So why on earth would there be fedoras and top hats laying on the ice after a hat trick? So I'd like to answer go ahead, that. Counterpoint. Let's go. So, okay. Obviously those are not the hats that people throw on the ice, but if I remember the story correctly, I don't remember if it was the Maple Leafs in like the twenties or thirties, but there was some hat store. That would, if the local team, if one of the players scored three goals in a game, they would give him a hat. So that's how it became known as a hat trick. Like, oh, I scored three goals. I'm going to go get my free hat tomorrow from this hat shop where the owner's a really big fan and he wants us to win. So that was like an incentive for them to want to get that third goal if they got a second goal. And that's where the term came from. Right. But um, And it was Toronto. Okay. It was the Maple Leafs. Okay. That store guy said, if any visiting team, a player scores three goals, come in and I'll give you a hat. Visiting team. 
So we uh, yes. So if they scored against the Maple Leafs, yes. Well, it, it it started off as it was supposed to be like just one night. I think it was. Okay. It was just like a a thing that the guy said, I guess. Okay. And then it just took off from there. And it actually, I believe that story is on the back of that Lemieux card if you read it. Oh God, I don't, I don't, Jesus, I don't have it in. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay, so way to go, Sal. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have it in front of me. You do. So obviously, <laughs> I know my hockey has. I so I was saying this without looking at the card, but the card. I'm going to read it. It says the term hat trick was coined more than 50 years ago when the owner of a Toronto hat store promised he would give one of his hats to a visiting player if he scored three goals in a game that night against the Maple Leafs. The Chicago Blackhawks player did one better that night, scoring four times, and thus the legend of the hat trick was born. Now it is commonplace for fans across the NHL to flood the ice with hats whenever a player scores three goals in a game. So, okay, yay, I know my history. But, yeah, it's funny. I had this in front of me the whole time, and I'm just, like, going off, going off what's what's stored in the old memory banks here. And I, like, literally had this in front of my face. <laughs> You know what though, Tim? It's just a cool picture. You know, I it mean, this just cool kind of goes with the whole, no, yeah, the whole cool no factor of the set. You know, right? And I have no problem with that. I just always looked at that, going, "Who wears these dumb hats to a game? Nobody. Nobody's showing up at a hockey game in a fedora." No, not since the '60s. If you ever yeah. see like those old photos from like the '50s and '60s, and if you can see the audience, a lot of times they're dressed really nice. Yeah. In fact, I think like three or four of the hats are fedoras, and one of them looks like the Undertaker's hat with the real wide brim on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, but he's holding a top hat, and I always thought that was funny. I'm like, does uh, Uncle Moneybags or whatever his name is from Monopoly go to like hockey games? He's got his top hat and his monocle. Is it Mr. Peanut? I mean, who has a top hat at a freaking hockey game? I just always thought that was funny about that card as one of the, one of the inserts. And the painted wire set, that is a highly underrated set. Yeah, it's it's kind of like the mask set, although it's just close-ups of the goalie. It's not like, well, some are closer than others, you know, but like it's it's a nice set. I like it. Um, the reason why I call it underrated mm -hmm. is because the pinnacle mask set in these day and age when everybody's clamoring for 90s insert cards is mm -hmm. almost unattainable. This set is way more affordable. Right. So that's why I say that it's an underrated set. But those sets just had like a photo, a lot of times just a photo of the mask itself. And here this is like a photo of the player wearing the mask. And then I like that little icon, the little witch doctor drawing that would not be politically correct today. I mean, I like the Painted Warrior set. I liked everything about this set, about Leaf pretty much. Well, the only other thing I would say about this set is if you are going to go out there and buy some boxes, just remember that you will find a USA edition and a Canadian edition. However, to our knowledge and to most people's knowledge, there is no difference between the cards that are inside the packs. So not Those bilingual? Are, not bilingual at all? It's It looks like it's bilingual, but it just says Canadian edition. And I've never seen anything printed in French at all. And in fact, all the cards say, you know, copyright leaf printed in the USA. So well, if someone, if someone does pull something, yeah. find if someone it, sees something, let us know. Cause I've yeah, never yeah. seen anything. No, nah, that would have been, that would have been unearthed by now. I mean, we know that there's upper deck English, upper deck French and pro set English and pro set French and score right. bilingual and score Canadian English and like all these different variations. But you know, if, it needs to have bilingual packaging to be sold in Canada. So right. they had to do different wrappers and different boxes. But I mean, it's yeah, the and same. The bilingual packaging is a little more rare to find these days, but it's the same cards in the packs. Yeah. There's hardly any text on the cards anyways. I mean, it's just right. a, a line of stats, the stat headers. Right, and really where you'd see the big difference would be in the inserts, or especially the Mario Lemieux collection ones, if there were French versions. Because mm -hmm. that's where a lot of the dialogue is, is printed on the back. Or go for the Series 2 team cards of like the Panthers and the Ducks to see if it's in French. I've never seen it. 
So someone find one and show me, but I've never seen it. Yeah, hashtag stern negativity. <laughs> oh, what? actually, Come you on. know what? Before we go, somebody left us a comment on last week's podcast. Obviously, they used the pseudonym. It's XOXOXO. <laughs> and and their comment, so XO times three, their comment was Clemente and Stoner Negativity together in one podcast. Yes, all capital letters with like six exclamation points. Great podcast, boys. And I agree. I'll never get a Bedard Young Guns card either. I mean, if I'm the only one that's going to have a nickname, then I'm fine with it. Stoner negativity. If that's what you all think of me, then I'm good with it. I will yeah. own it. It's yeah. not a nickname. It's a lifestyle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like... <laughs> yeah, okay. But you can't you can't uh, give we'll yourself a nickname. It has to be given to you. Otherwise, we'd all be known as T-Bone, right? <laughs> <laughs> or hey, I you. Was, I thought that was my nickname, was T-Bone. <laughs> That was a Seinfeld, right? Yeah. Yeah. George wanted can't, to be called T-Bone. Can't give yourself your own nickname. No, you cannot. They just have to happen. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully mine doesn't end up being annoying guy with high-pitched voice or whatever. So, that's, too, that's, uh, too, that's too long. That's too long. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's also low-hanging fruit. Yeah. Exactly. I'm, I had some great nicknames for my friends in college, but I'm not going to share those here because this is PG 13. This is a PG 13 podcast. Come on, guys. A family podcast, guys. Come on. All right. This was a great show, guys. Thank you for indulging me talking about this set. It's uh, time for us to leave. Yeah. <laughs> Drop mic. Uh, and until next time, collect what you like. For more hockey goodness, follow us on Twitter at PuckJunk.